as I said, it's a spin-off from the University of Stellenbosch near, uh, near Cape Town in South Africa. And most of the products that we have now and that we can make available to our clients, the first version of all these products actually started as master thesis or mm. student projects in, uh, in, in general. So I'm not one of the co-founders. I, I joined the company afterwards. But what happened to this group, uh, this group of students and their, uh, and their professor after having spent many years, many student projects building these different products, and some of them were reaction wheels, and some of them were sun sensors and magnetokers and all of these. They actually realized that they had a pretty nice product portfolio. And they started the company out of the product instead of looking at the, the products were there already. So it's not the maybe more traditional way of first looking, having an idea, looking at the market, seeing how this idea would fit into the, into the market. In this case, the products were there already. And fitting into the market at that, at that point was relatively easy because the CubeSat world was just booming. So mm -hmm. everybody, every university was building, started to build, to build CubeSats. All right, we're back with another episode of the Cold Star Project, the podcast about space, small sats, and scaling these kinds of companies. My guest today is Benoit Chameau. He is, uh, I believe, originally French with a name like that, but he lives in the Hague area and works for a South African company. And we are going to dig into how the heck all that happened. Uh, he has a master's degree, uh, two actually, one from Lausanne and the other from MIT in things like Metatronics, Robotics, uh, Automation Engineering, Systems Engineering. That's very cool. And he has a cold. He wants me to tell you that. So he is not bored <laughs> or disinterested. He has a cold. So Benoit, thanks for being here. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a small, a uh, small yeah. correction, if you, okay. if you don't mind. It's not French. Right. I'm Swiss. Ah, and, uh, Swiss. Okay. And if there are people who who know me out there, they will, uh, they will know that it's important for me. I usually oh, get absolutely. Uh, confused for a Frenchman. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that is important. <laughs> I forgot about Switzerland and the three different. <laughs> yeah, that that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's see, you've got these uh, two master's degrees. Uh, how the heck did that happen? You go to Lausanne and MIT. Yeah, so actually I was at MIT as a, as a visiting student as part of my, uh, my courses in, uh, in Lausanne. So the both of them were combined. Um, yeah, so I originally from, from Switzerland and Lausanne was just next to, next to my hometown mm -hmm. so that's the uh, that's the university i uh, i did my uh, bachelor at and uh, and then followed by my uh, by my masters um and it's i think it's only through connections through, through some of my professors there at uh, at epfl that i got the chance to uh, to do a year at uh, at, uh, at mit and do this uh, this combined masters um there have been some uh, some agreements since uh, as, as far as um, space studies are concerned between epfl where i studied in Lausanne. And, and, uh, and MIT, uh, and I think I was one of one of the first students to go through that uh, through that program. Okay, and this is around 2012, that era, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got my uh, I got my masters in uh, 2012. Yeah. Okay. Very very cool. Um, did you work on any interesting projects? A lot of the the master's degree students I talk to have a supervisor, a PhD supervisor, and they're working on some kind of technical project. Yeah. So I. I started in uh, in robotics, but actually most of the practical projects I worked on were with the uh, uh, what would become then the Swiss Space Center, uh, which was part of the university at that uh, at that time. Uh, I got to do some pretty cool uh, radiation testing on uh, on electric components um, as my one of my first semester projects, and then a couple of projects on an experiment that actually flew. On a sounding rocket that was launched from uh, from Sweden, from northern Sweden, so that's part of the uh, the Rexis Bexis program from the uh, the European Space Agency. Um, so I actually got to yeah build some of that stuff as part of a, a group of seven or eight students that uh, that we were, and then we uh, we traveled to uh, Kiruna in northern Sweden in the middle of the winter, um, minus forty degrees uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit doesn't matter <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's the same temperature and it's very very cold in any case mm. Mm. but um, great experience huh yeah and no, so that no, shifted definitely. your interest from robotics to to space then um, yeah ex exactly um, and so yeah we had a new a new type of sensors that we were uh, that we were working on that worked on a, on a, in a closed loop so as part of my studies in uh, in robotics, then I had some uh, some background in uh, in control theory that I could apply to the uh, to the project. 
So that's okay. what definitely got me uh, one one foot into the uh, into the space industry. Okay. And the uh, oh yeah, the space technologies in any case. Right, and of course you can use robotics in space. Um, yeah. There's a a fellow you may already know who I'll connect you with after, and maybe you'll have some suggestions for me as well on who to talk to, interview maybe. Yep. Um, because I, I, I don't know anything about this Swiss Space Center or anything like that. That's, uh, that's completely new to me. So I'm very interested in hearing about that. So Yeah, actually you, I, can, mm -hmm. I, I can already make some, some connections in that, in that sense that um, one of my supervisor at, uh, at UPFL, uh, Muriel Richard, she actually started a company now uh, called mm -hmm. Clear Space. Um, to actually clean debris uh, out of out of space, and that's the so that's through her that I managed to go to to MIT. And the project that I was involved in at MIT was designing missions and optimizing missions to remove uh, to remove space debris. Mm -hmm. So yeah, defining how many spacecraft we would need. If it's better to have one spacecraft picking up one debris or one spacecraft visiting multiple debris to uh, to to remove them and uh, and deorbit them. Huh. And uh, yeah, so that was quite a theoretical project at the at the yeah. time, but it's becoming more and more relevant and more and more practical as well. Hmm. It sounds like that traveling salesman problem appears again, where you got one yeah. thing to go to multiple places, but now this they're moving. So yeah, um, there was a guest uh, recently interviewed who we covered that. So and and that will have come out by the time this episode does. So we'll, yeah. we'll be able to go back and, and listen to that. Uh, I don't think it was Florian Gauthier, but it was his uh, supervisor, the fellow at Cranfield. Anyway, okay. you, um, you now work for a South African manufacturer called Cube Space. And yeah. uh, I've had a look over their website. Um, I ran a metal fab shop back in Vancouver for a couple of years. And uh, Milling machines are very cool, and um, you know, I, I operated a plasma cutting table, and so, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of neat, uh, and it's it's not an area where I wanted to really continue, but it was great to have that experience. And so when I saw the attitude determination control systems and that right, and the and the reaction wheel products, I'm like, this is the, the reaction wheel, especially look milled straight out of a solid block of gold or something, like that, right? <laughs> You know, they're, they're very nice and very cool. So that's what CubeSpace focuses on is that ADCS components, um, the reaction wheels, sun sensors, things like that. They're criti critical systems for satellites. Um, um, you know, you know a heck of a lot more about it than I do. So I'm curious how you got connected with them. They're, they're obviously centered in South Africa. You're in the Hague area right now. How did, yeah. how did this partnership come about? Yes, yeah, so I've been uh, I've been living in the Netherlands now for the past uh, six or seven years. Uh, I worked in a, for a company uh, that's already involved in the uh, in the space industry as well, uh, innovative solutions in space. If you spell the acronym, that's ISIS. So it's a great icebreaker when you when you work for them and uh, you have to introduce the company or uh, across the U.S. customs, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, and they are designing and, and building smaller, uh, small satellites. So I work for them as an engineer first and uh, as a business developer uh, af mm. afterwards. Uh, so that's how I ended up in, uh, in, in this area. That's, that's why I'm in the Netherlands now. Um, CubeSpace have been involved for the past um, five, five or six years now in the, uh, in, in the industry. They've been around for, uh, for a bit. They've spun off from the uh, uh, University of Stellenbosch. Uh, in South Africa near uh, near Cape Town and so I know them from my previous job I know them from conferences and uh, yeah it's a it's a small world in the end and uh, when we go to conferences everybody gathered together coming from everywhere in, in the world but it's it's a fairly small um, and, and really friendly community as well um, so it's actually Really, very common for people to to go from one company to uh, to another, stay in stay in that world, stay in that uh, in that community, but um, change hats every now uh, every mm -hmm. now. And then. Uh, so that's yeah, that's how it started. Um, it's a very small uh, company, so we are uh, we less than twenty people. We're about uh, seventeen or eighteen now. Um, very very dynamic, quite uh, quite young, and that's the kind of kind of things that I was looking for as well. Uh, and we, I think we just had, yeah, we just had a good, uh, a good match uh, in, in that sense. 
uh, and me being based in uh, based in Europe now is also very convenient for uh, for us as a as a company because even though all the engineering and all the manufacturing is done in South Africa, as you can imagine, uh, ninety nine percent of the business we're doing is in the northern hemisphere, mm -hmm. so not even out out of Africa, but it's in in Europe, in uh, in the States, uh, in uh, in Asia, uh, mostly yeah China, Korea, uh, Japan, this kind this kind of places. So having somebody um, abroad and somebody who can travel easily is also uh, also an advantage for the company. Okay, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I am curious about like uh, tariffs or import limitations or something like that. It, it, is there anything like that for space products from outside of countries being brought in, say, to the United States? No, importing for the U.S. is usually pretty easy. It's uh, they have they have a hard time exporting. Huh. Um, so I don't know yeah, if you ITAR. are if you're familiar with uh, with ITAR or uh, or EAR. Yeah. So regulations related to uh, to export of uh, of products with dual use, so that can be used for civilian or military applications, uh, which is a big uh, a big thing in the in the U.S. makes it very difficult for uh, for U.S. companies to uh, to export products. Um, we have something like this as well in South Africa and and in Europe as as well. So there are always some if not restrictions, at least regulations, mm -hmm. uh, but that are not as tight as the, uh, as the one in the, uh, in the US. I think what we're seeing in the US is, first of all, that's the country in which we have the most competition uh, mm -hmm. because there are so many companies because the ecosystem in the US is, uh, is so, so big. There are just, yeah, so many, so many actors in the, uh, in, in the business um, that is just, very natural for for NASA or a U.S. company or U.S. university to just go to a U.S. supplier first. So it's not really the regulation or any state-imposed restriction that that makes the business sometimes a bit more difficult for us. It's just the the market is the market is full actually, okay. and and which makes it nice in a sense because that means that we just need to find a way to bring out better products or cheaper products. Or, uh, or or make a difference in uh, in in this kind of way instead of just fighting uh, fighting regulation. So it's actually very open in that sense. Right. And and for our listeners, uh, I did do an episode of ITAR versus EAR, and I think that's in the Make Space Boring playlist on YouTube. If you go to Cold Star Technologies on YouTube and look at the playlist, there'll be a number of them. I've chopped up the episodes pretty well. And Make Space Boring is its own thing. It's, it's more of a short series. And uh, I, I wanted to look into ITAR myself and, and compare it with the EAR and see what the difference was. Well, I think that, that lets us have a pretty good segue there, Benoit, to what is it about CubeSpace and, and their ADCS components that is, you, you're in sales now, it's, it's your job <laughs> to, to make CubeSpace's products look, sound, feel better than everybody else's. So what, what, how do you um, pitch that, basically? So I think the main, the main thing that we're, trying, that we're trying to do, which is um, more relevant when we do integrated systems. So I can, I can explain a bit what I, what I mean by that. Sure. But what I, what I want to say first is we position ourselves as a real partner in terms of uh, ADCS development. Um, so for a very long time in the, in the CubeSat world, in the CubeSat industry, people were really hoping for, for plug, and pre, plug and play and realized afterwards that it was more plug and pray. Uh, that systems don't necessarily, they do work out of the box on their own, but they don't necessarily work out of the box with the other systems that you got out of other boxes. Um, and especially with, uh, with ADCS, so the attitude control system has interfaces with the entirety of the rest of the spacecraft. Uh, it needs power. It provides data, sometimes really a lot of data. Uh, it needs to be, it needs to be commended in different, uh, in different modes. Uh, and, um, yeah, in different modes of, uh, of operations. Um, and and at the same time it has a big uh, mechanical components so every sensor that you will have will need to be properly aligned with the rest of the spacecraft with your main mm -hmm. instrument on the uh, on the satellite um, if you have an optical payload you want the satellite to be as stable as possible so you can take good pictures but as 
part of the ADCS, you have reaction wheels. And if, if you know anything about, about them, you know that they will generate micro vibrations that you have, that you have to manage. Um, and all of this will, all, will also change um, with, the, with the thermal environment as the satellite is getting cold and warm and, and all of this. Uh, so you have all these different aspects and it's really a system um, discipline but we are a subsystem supplier. So we will always go the extra mile to try and help our, our clients and try and help our, our users uh, to integrate this system as best as they can in their, uh, in their satellite. Uh, we'll spend time doing simulations for them, showing them what in their specific case, the system will be, will be able to do and, uh, and how to tune it and how to optimize it to, uh, to, to use it. Um, so yeah, we are, positioning ourselves as partners more than more than suppliers uh, we are also yeah as open as we can uh, as we can be um, our pricing are on on our websites the uh, the lead times are pretty straightforward as well um, most of our documents are just on the website ready to to download if they are not that means that we're usually working on the next revision but it's just uh, it's just an email uh, an email away uh, and i think that's also a way maybe as a non-US supplier that we can differentiate ourselves because we don't have any restriction on the documentation that we can provide, for instance. So having all of this out of the open, uh, in, the, in the open and letting uh, engineers who are our, our clients in the, in the end, just have a look at the documentation, understand the product, uh, the product better, instead of having to deal with just a black box. I think that's one of the things that we, uh, that we do really well. Okay. And uh, what you say about the lead times and <laughs> being honest about them and, and uh, open is very important for project scheduling. Yep. Uh, I go, go back to 1999. This is how far back I'm going, uh, an era in which I had hair. And <laughs> I miss it. Um, I, I was working for a, a company in the power generation field that manufactured automatic transfer switches, which switch the power over to the gen set when their grid goes out. And uh, contractors would come to me and, and want that lead time for certain. And I went to the production manager for this one project and he, he lied to me. He told me what I needed to hear to get the order. And then we blew the delivery date and that customer was mad at me. I mean, he called me up and he was very, very unhappy because we had set their schedule back. So for CubeSpace to be saying, look, this is the production schedule. This is your timeline for getting this. Uh, critical component here um, and this is what it is that's very very important uh, yeah. and also when you when you look at the the 40 percent plus failure rate for small sats um, a lot of it comes from that uh, project schedule and how it's just knocked around and beat up and ripped apart and not, <laughs> it doesn't get executed properly and so there's no time for testing components which you've pointed out is so so important because everything's yeah. touching everything else and vibrations are being made in that um maybe let's describe a adcs component really really quickly uh to me it looked i mean it looked like a couple of motherboards like two wafers stacked on top of each other kind of thing uh, how, how else would you describe it uh well that's the that's definitely the way it looks for sure uh and then you will have a bunch of uh, of cameras pointing in different uh, in different mm -hmm. directions uh, and then you have these bigger metallic boxes that are the uh, that are the reaction wheels. So that's actually the housing. The wheel is uh, the wheel is inside. Mm -hmm. uh, but to break it down to to functionality, so there are I would say four main components. Uh, the, the the first part are the sensors. So the different cameras that are mentioned. Some of them are sun sensors. Some of them are earth sensors. Some of them are star trackers. So they will look at these different bodies, uh, the, the Earth, the Sun, and the and the stars, and and compare that to to model that that it has, to try and understand where the uh, where those objects are, and that leads into the second the second part of the system, which is the determination part. Mm -hmm. So you have the Earth sensor is telling you well the Earth is in this direction, and the Sun sensor is telling you well the Sun is in this in this direction, and then. The goal of this algorithm is to define, well, based on these different inputs that I have, what is the most realistic current attitude, the current orientation, the current, uh, the current angles that my satellite is, uh, is at. The third step is 
controlling the uh, the attitude. So it's comparing this uh, determined attitude, this determined um, state of the satellite with where the satellite is supposed to be. Uh, so if you want to point your camera at a specific target on the uh, on on the ground, and your attitude determination uh, algorithm is telling you where you are off pointing by uh, by this much then it's the role of the controller which is just software to say well this is how i have to to correct and then the controller will control the different actuators so mainly the reaction wheel to say okay spin the wheel in this in this direction at this at this speed for that much that much time and then the satellite will just will just move around um, and and if there is anybody out there that that is not sure exactly how the reaction will work it's it's exactly what it is it's just based on, uh, on on Newton third law, so the, the wheel will spin in one direction, and because the satellite is floating in space, there is nothing to uh, to constrain it. Then it will just spin in the other direction, and you simply transfer momentum from the wheel onto the uh, onto the, the the spacecraft. The, the system is as simple as that. Hmm. And so those four components: sensors, attitude determination algorithms, controllers, and actuators is what we. Uh, what we call ADCS, and then CubeSpace does all the different components of that, uh, and the software that goes with it. And all of this is in this nice package that you describe as the different modules. Right. Yeah, it's very cool. You can't afford to be second best. You need to be first, and that requires speed. Now, if you're thinking that growth is supposed to be slow and steady, frankly, the way I was taught back in the '90s in the operations management and business administration programs. You are too slow. We have to adapt. And in space, it's no different than anywhere else. People like to think they're special in space, and it is fun, all the stuff we get to work on, but business is business. The fundamentals nowadays are conservative growth is not good. You need to run as fast as you can and risk outstripping your supply lines, which means in our world, using up the capital that we've got. That's a risk but there is no prize for second place. There certainly is no prize for third. If you want to scale operationally fast, come talk to us at Cold Star Tech. We are the process experts for scaling fast. Now back to the interview. There's a YouTuber named Scott Manley who's kind of a commentator on the industry, and sometimes he plays space video games and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> he's enjoyable. And I remembered when I, when I was looking at the website about the reaction wheels, I, I remembered he had a video about the Kepler spacecraft failing because of a reaction wheel about a year and a half ago, and that many reaction wheels had been failing. And they thought they had traced it down to this one manufacturer, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So uh, you guys, uh, Cube Space is making it your own your own cube wheels. That's the branded name, I guess. Um, in South Africa, so yeah. there's there's a machine shop somewhere there. Uh, I, yeah. I'm curious about why the company chose to manufacture this particular product. So the um, the story of the company is very much bottom up. So okay. as I as I said, it's a spin-off from the uh, the University of Stellenbosch near uh, near Cape Town in uh, in South Africa. And most of the products that we have now and that we can make available to our clients, the first version of all these products actually started as master thesis or mm. student projects in uh, in in general. Um, so I'm not one of the uh, of the the co-founders. I, I joined the company afterwards. But what happened to this group uh, this group of students and their uh, and their professor after having spent many years, many student projects building these different products. And some of them were reaction wheels and some of them were sun sensors and magnet talkers and all of this. Um, they actually realized that they had a pretty nice uh, product portfolio. And they started the company out of the product instead of looking at the, the products were there already. So it's not the maybe more traditional way of first looking, having an idea, looking at the market, seeing how this idea would fit into the, uh, into the market. In this case, the products were there already. Um, and fitting into the market at that, at that point was um, relatively easy because the, um, the CubeSat world was just, was just booming. So mm -hmm. everybody, every university was building, started to build, to build CubeSats. Um, and yeah, ADCS is one of the, one of the hardest parts of building a, building a spacecraft as well. Uh, I know that there are RF engineers and thermal engineers out there that will disagree and that their thing is way, way harder. <laughs> um, 
but it's it's very convenient uh, at the time for for just universities to be able to uh, to buy these systems uh, off the shelf and you mentioned before that one of the big reasons for cubesat failing is the the timeline being being squeezed uh, and that's definitely one of them another big one is um uh, lack of experience sometimes and mm -hmm. issues with uh, with more workmanships uh, that also relates to not having enough time to, to test, of course. And so a lot of the, the clients that we have now in the university world are actually looking at buying some of the key subsystems or subsystems that they don't necessarily have an interest in developing in-house mm -hmm. so that they know they can rely on, on something that is, that is proven, that has flown before, that has been used by many different uh, um, CubeSats developers and, and manufacturers. And so they can rely, really rely on this uh, while they focus on, on developing something completely new, which is in the end what the university should be doing. And the, of course, the best ADC has gone out there is that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. And that's exactly what universities shouldn't be doing. <laughs> All right. So I like it. Um, many, many of the university professors I talk to are in charge of their own CubeSat lab or something. They have master's degree students come and go and they flow through and they don't get to keep any of that institutional knowledge. And so, you know, you might have had somebody with experience last year, but this year you've got a bunch yep. of newbie kids again who don't know anything. And that puts you back to square one, like you said. So yep. this, this is really important where uh, a, a company or um, academic organization can pull in the experience from CubeSpace and say, okay, yes, at least this part, we've got it handled, right? We can trust this part. And now let's go muck around with this other stuff. Um, I, I am curious about sun sensors. I'm, I'm connected to a couple of manufacturers through LinkedIn who I've talked to, but I've never had one on the show yet. Um, and, and I really, you know, they use CMOS sensors. It's like a camera basically, um, but I don't know much about them. The website mentioned Flight Heritage. You, you brought up, look, they want something that's flown before. Uh, tell us a little bit about this and, and why they're important. Yes, um, yes, so that's one of the, one of the ways to, uh, to determine the attitude of the, of the satellite. It's understanding where the satellite is pointing with respect to the, uh, to the sun. Um, so the, the way our sensor is working is basically simply taking an image. It's a very wide angle image of the, uh, of the sky. Mm -hmm. And you will have this, uh, this bright object in it. So it's about half, uh, half a degree uh, in, the, uh, in, the field, uh, in the field of view. And that's, that's simply where the sun is. So it will, in our sensor, it's going to illuminate um, a, whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of pixels with different intensity. Uh, and then we have an algorithm looking at the center of this uh, of this bright spot in the uh, in the sensor frame, and so that's determining where the uh, where the sun is. Um, our sensors are actually pretty unique in this uh, in, in this way. So there is uh, another technology that is that is used, which is um, very similar to a pinhole camera. Mm. Uh, and so instead of having a wide uh, array of uh, wide array of uh, of pixels like we like we do, you only have four of these pixels, four photodiodes. Uh, the, the, uh, the light from the sun is going to go to the, pin, uh, to the pinhole, and then depending on uh, where it's shining on the, on the sensor, it will illuminate um, some of these uh, four pixels more than, more than others. So four of these photodiodes are going to be illuminated more than, more than others. Um, it's, it's very good in the sense that it's a very simple design. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to, uh, to, to build and to, uh, and to align. Um, the problem with those is that typically compared to the sensors that we have, the field of view is much narrower. Uh, so you would need more of these sensors spread around this, around the spacecraft, depending what else you have in the, in the field of view or where you want to mount them, it can be a bit cumbersome. In our cases, with just two of our sensors, so we, are, we make sure that we always have uh, coverage and we always see the sun uh, somewhere. So that's the, that's the idea. And that's also part of the story of the company that these students were just looking into a different way of having a, a sun sensor, wondering if that was possible. That's how they came up with this new way of, of, doing, of doing things and then this new product uh, came up. Um, and, and then you had a question about, about flight heritage, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, a, what, uh, what missions have they been on? Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. So we've, we've flown on something like 20 or 30 different missions with that, uh, with that sensor. 
Um, so it started in, on two, two, two U um, satellites, two, two kilogram satellites that flew in, uh, in 2014 where we could, uh, we could try these sensors for the, uh, for the first time. And uh, we also have the capability of, of downloading pictures uh, with, uh, with them. Um, we have uh, an Earth sensor that, that works in exactly the same way. It's actually the same, the same type of camera. There's just some filters that are, that are different on there. But then with this wide angle camera, we can actually take a picture of the Earth, black and white picture of the, uh, of the Earth, detect the center using the exact same algorithm. Um, and uh, and then with the same design, we have then two two different vectors that we can that we can see the Earth and the Sun, and then determine the attitude thanks to that. And that also allowed us to download some some nice black and white picture of the uh, of the Earth, which is also something that is really exciting because hearing the satellite beeping from from space. I mean, I've I've done it. I have worked on a few spacecraft that are that are up there. It's always cool when we can hear them. Uh, but getting an images from from these satellites when they are orbiting that makes everything much much more concrete right and, and that's also what's super, super exciting about it yeah you get to see what they see um, yes <laughs> too bad for all the flat earthers but <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so you mentioned you can download uh and i'm curious about uploading obviously the algorithm is part of the firmware that's installed uh, on the board. Can that be changed or updated if there's a problem or somebody figures out an improvement two years from now? Yeah, so it's, okay. uh, it, it takes a bit of work uh, together with the, uh, with the satellite integrator to make sure that there is enough bandwidth on the, uh, on the uplink uh, so that we can load a new, a new image and then there are a few small uh, mechanisms that, uh, that need to be in place in order to, uh, to safely reprogram the, uh, the, the program memory on the, on the system. But yeah, that's something that we can do. So there are already a long, long list of parameters that can be, that can be changed. So all the controllers and everything can be tuned. Um, we, can, we can change thresholds and, and all of this. Uh, but if needed, uh, if a full, full software update is required on the, uh, on the system for any reason, and the mechanisms are, uh, are in place, that's also something that we can do. Uh, and that we we know is getting more and more requested because hmm. nowadays that's something that people expect uh, to have over the air update of everything they own uh, from phones to uh, to cars and that includes satellites as well. So if there is any uh, any issues, then we can uh, then we can reprogram these uh, these systems. Okay, and is that something that uh, a person would have to walk into a ground station and upload from there? I guess on a thumb yes. drive or something so, okay i just yeah. i'm just thinking about it like i haven't had my ground station expert on yet to tell me how these things work he's booked but uh so it's just i'm thinking about it's like oh but well that sounds really good we could just update it yeah well it's not like you're sitting at your computer uh, at your desk and you just tap a few buttons in an app and up it goes you know <laughs> yeah so, so it's so it's whatever system you're using to control your satellite. Mm -hmm. So if you are working with a with a ground segment supplier, or if you have your own ground segment that allows you to operate from your living room, from your from your laptop, and you can upload something to your satellite, it would be a simple comments to say, well, download an image now, or it can be a full new uh, software uh, software image that you that you upload to the satellite. Uh, if you have the mechanisms in place from the start to be able to do that from your living room, then uploading our system yeah. can, our software can also be done from your living room. Yeah, I get you just have to have good security. <laughs> yes, exactly. Please, good network security. <laughs> yeah. No one should be allowed to just walk in there <laughs> and touch it. Yeah, yeah, so, just don't give you your password and yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. So I'm curious about you personally, uh, why you chose to go into a sales role. You did start off at engineering with this company yeah. and then move into sales. Not everyone does that. Not every engineer wants to do that. So what is it about you that made you want to do this? Well, I, I think I'm an engineer who is not afraid of people and I'm not afraid of traveling. And they were a good, uh, good sign that, uh, that I would do all right in sales, I think. Mm. Um, I think the other thing was I, yeah, I'm always, I'm always interested in, in what's, what's beyond what I do as an engineer, but how are these things mm. applied, how are they used and, and being in touch with, uh, with clients from, from day one, basically when, um, yeah, they're having these, these first ideas about the new and project is, is always really exciting. Um, I've, I've worked with people in my current role in my previous job as well that had no connection whatsoever with the space industry. They, mm. they had a need, they wanted to work on an application um, 
that required a satellite or could use a, a satellite, but they didn't they didn't know what was feasible, didn't know the constraints that were that were there. And there is yeah, there is a bit exploratory phase in the work that I do that I find really, really interesting and, and very challenging as well. Um, working with people on defining what they need, regardless of what they think they want, uh, is, is something that is, yeah, that is always, always a challenge and always, always very interesting. There is a part of education in there as mm. well. So especially working with people who don't know uh, much about about the space industry there is education from us to from us to them but that also goes the other way around because we learn all the time about mm -hmm. new industries and people with completely different backgrounds and completely different stories and that i think is something that i find yeah really really interesting in my job well cool yeah that process of discovery uh, yeah. and and working for this company that is very clear on their website that they want to provide opportunities for young engineers uh, and so I'm curious then, um, you're interested in this process of discovery and, and finding and integrating and, and, and that, um, I guess we could wrap up with this question in, <laughs> this almost feels like a job interview question, but I am curious, <laughs> it's a perspective thing for me as well. Um, say it's 10 years from now, what, what would you hope to have done other than uh, move a lot of products for cube space, right? And, and discover a lot about integrating in these other industries? Well, that does sound like a job interview question. Yeah. <laughs> Are we talking salaries after this? Or uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. I think one thing I'm I'm hoping to I'm hoping to bring, and I I know what I know it's your catchphrase as well that you want to make space boring. So I'm just going to <laughs> I'm just going to use that. But I think I wish to be able to change sometimes the um, the pure aerospace uh, mindset that we mm. have. That we have to, and even even though we think it's changing with the CubeSat world, it's not always always the case. Because as people are working on different satellites and making mistakes, there is always this tendency to go back to we need more testing and we need more documentation and we need to over engineer uh, uh, ev everything and which is not something wrong you want to increase reliability you want to make the product better and everything but i think that taking an approach which is pragmatic and um, commercially sound and and sometimes oriented towards the business model of the company that we that we're working for who are our clients is also something that we that we need to be able to do and I think that transforming the space industry into the um, the industry that is now, which is always always yeah cutting edge and pushing boundaries and 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 making sure that also at the same time everything everything is safe and mm -hmm. everybody being completely completely risk averse uh, and by that doing always new custom designs and years and years and years of, of testing. For a, for a one-off product, and then moving moving to something to something a bit uh, to something a bit different, into something that resembles maybe a bit more what what we see in the in the car industry, with um, um, many many different suppliers actually bringing their products and their and their systems to a whole a whole ecosystem. And if you look at the BMW or uh, or let's say a Toyota or an, or another another car brand, um, most of the supply chain that is um, um, behind these behind these cars are actually very fairly similar and it's and it's using um a different approach and the economy of scales and and all of this to um yeah have this have this whole ecosystem uh, come come together in a, in 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 a sense um in a, yeah again in a, in a mindset which is a lot more industrial a lot more commercially oriented mm -hmm. in 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 some points and probably in some cases even more pragmatic Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I think I think a company like CubeSpace is doing that is doing that very well because we do one thing and we do it well and that's and that's ADCS and when you see so many of these of these companies uh, going completely fully vertically integrated and in a lot of cases for the main reason that they don't trust suppliers mm -hmm. and so they are reinventing the wheels and they are spending again years and years designing something. Uh, for a for a one-off mission or a one-off application, um, in, instead of yeah relying on on suppliers that are providing systems for 
hundreds of different uh, of different manufacturers and by that gaining heritage and gaining experience and improving and improving reliability and i think if we can start changing this mindset of designing everything custom in house mm. and without realizing that the neighbor is doing the exact same thing and the neighbor's neighbors is doing that as well mm. uh, I, I think that would be pretty great if we can make it boring in that way right no i like it i like the vision excellent all right, uh, Ben Washemo has been my guest. He's from Cube Space, a South African firm. He's based in Europe. Uh, where can people go to find out more about Cube Space and you as well? Um, yeah, so we have our uh, website, so cubespace.co.za. Um, you should uh, you should spend time uh, refreshing it uh, these days because we have uh, we have a big update of the of the website coming in the in the next month okay. or so. Um, so cool, cool new design, plenty of new, uh, of new informations. Uh, and otherwise, you can just look for uh, Cubespace ADCS on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, and you can, uh, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Okay, cool. I will connect up on Twitter as well because I didn't know that. I hadn't looked. Uh, by the time yeah. this episode comes out, the update will definitely be done. So people will enjoy the new and exciting uh, website. Also, I will link to it in the description uh, on YouTube and in the, the audio podcast um, because there's, from the North American standpoint, there's some extra letters in there in the URL and I'll make sure that you get to the right place. All right, Benoit, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, Jason. Hey, this is Jason Kanigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory compliance and gosh the end customer who would have thought about that right so you can sign up for this if you go to coldstartech.com slash msb that's short for make space boring the mission we're on then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted I'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, I'm able to. So those will be some goodies that are in there as well. So if you're interested in that, go to coldstartech.com msb and join us on the mission to make space boring.